we're continuing with our Jesus series. So if you haven't picked up one of the little booklets with the reading plan in yet, then you can grab one from the Connect team on your way out. But we're going through this, this series. And uh, last week, Pete so helpfully talked to us, talked to us about the, the birth of Jesus and how, what, do we, what do we see in that God become man, this turning point in all of history where the king of the universe comes, comes down. We don't work our way up to him, but he comes down uh, in, uh, to the womb of a virgin, like he said, nourished by a placenta, God become man. And through this series, we want to see a vision of Jesus. We want to see him, like we read a couple of weeks ago in Isaiah 6, high and lifted up, seated on a throne, the train of his robe filling the temple. The King of Kings, the unapproachable God who becomes approachable in Jesus. And so today, we're, the, where, what we're looking at is Jesus and people. So last, the week one was pre-existent Jesus. Last week was uh, Jesus' uh, the birth. And this week is people. Next week, Rod will be talking to us about the stories that Jesus told. How do, how do we see Jesus there? What vision do we get of him there? But this morning is people. How did he interact with them? Um, who, did, who did he interact with? And we, if you were here last week, you'd have got a clue as to who he interacted with. Because we see from his birth, or we heard, we read it, that he wasn't, Jesus wasn't born at the heart of an empire in a palace surrounded by servants placed onto a throne. But he was born in an outpost of an empire surrounded by animals and shepherds and placed into a manger. We also heard last week in Matthew 1, where we recount, it gives us the genealogy of Jesus, like person by person. And, it, and it's not a, a list, a who's who list of who you maybe want if you are claiming to be uh, a, the Messiah, the Savior, someone who has got this incredible uh, lineage that he comes from. But it's, a, it's a, like a ragtag bunch of people that even includes women, which just wouldn't have been done in those, uh, in, the, in those days in that culture. And not just, not women of high renown, but uh, Ruth, who was a foreigner, Tamar, who prostituted herself, uh, Rahab, who was a prostitute. Women in those days wouldn't have, uh, they couldn't give evidence in court. They were considered second-class citizens. Yet yeah, Jesus, he interacted with women. Jesus, he, uh, Jesus, he loved children when other people would be, uh, saw them as a nuisance to be kept quiet and out of sight. Jesus welcomed them in. Right, we see from when we read the Gospels, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus interacts with all kinds of people. The, the, the disciples, the 12 men that he calls that follow him, aren't from the, uh, the upper echelons of society, but they're fishermen and tax collectors. They're not, the, they're not from the elite. Right, he doesn't go to the elite, but he goes to the outcasts, those on the fringe. Women, children, fishermen, adulterers, tax collectors. And so the reminder that we get, so I could just say that's the preach finished, right? We know Jesus, he didn't come. You don't have to be perfect to be here. Like we've already said, there's an invitation. If you're, if you're far off, if you are on the fringe, if you feel like an outsider, if you think, oh, I'm not good enough to, to be welcomed into the family of God, then we've, we, we've seen just from looking at very briefly at uh, what we saw in uh, last week and at who Jesus interacts with in the Gospels, we see we are included Right, the Holy One, he included the marginalized and the despised, those on the outskirts, those who are far off, are welcomed in and received respect. Right, it was good news for the people of the culture, and it is good news for us here this morning. Right, because we, all of us, were far off. We were all far away, and yet Jesus, the good news is that we read about in here is that he adopts us into his family, that we get to be called sons and daughters, not because of our own doing, not because we've, we've worked our way up to him, but because Jesus came down and sacrificed himself for us. And so the people that we, we read about in the Gospels, they had a vision of Jesus. They had a vision of, of something or someone who they would give their lives for. They would lay down their lives for. And so for us, as we, we're going to look at a, it's a short passage in Luke today. Um, but as we, 
as we look at it, I guess the question for us is to ask, do we have that same vision of Jesus? Do we know this Jesus? Right? Do you know this Jesus that we're going to look at? Because if we're going to have an impact in our town, like we've said over the last couple of weeks, if we have an impact beyond into the nations, then we need a vision of Jesus. We need to be captivated by the man, that we're, the, the disciples and the, uh, the, the men and the women and children who followed him. Uh, left everything for who when they saw him everything else was put into perspective because they saw him in his beauty and in his glory right and it propels us into mission to sustain us when difficult times come when we see the glory of if we want to see the glory of God made known in Worthing and the nations so we're in Luke 8. Unfortunately, there's a problem with the slides today. And so I'm just going to put with my reading. If you have a Bible or on your phone, you can turn to, to Luke 8. If you go find Matthew and Mark and then Luke, and we're in chapter 8 today. And just to put it into a bit of perspective, Jesus has been going around interacting with all sorts of people, the demon-possessed. Uh, he's been free, forgiving sins. He's been healing people. And so he's... His name has got out there. Okay? He's become a well-known. People are, uh, are turning up. When Jesus turns up, people are gathering, crowds are gathering to see what he is going to do next. And so I'm going to read and I'm going to pray. So chapter 8, verse 40. It says, Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he, had only, uh, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. <clears throat> as Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians... She could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who is it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive the power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house, that's Jairus, came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you there is power in even just reading your word like we've just done. And I pray that you would speak to us this morning through it. I pray you give us ears to hear what you are saying. Give us eyes to see what you are doing. I pray soften every single heart in this room. That we would know you more clearly. That we would see you in your glory, in your beauty, and in your love more clearly this morning. Amen. So some of you, or all of us I'd say, there's some part of your life that you just, don't, you just don't want anyone else to see or that you're embarrassed about or that you feel shame about or that you just this mistake that you made or uh, some failure that happened or something that was done to you or against you or something you're currently struggling with that we don't... The, the idea of everyone knowing about is just too much to bear. And in the story... We see that in the, the woman and there, uh, that comes to Jesus that we just read, that touches the fringe of his garment, that grabs hold of his robe. And there is good news for this woman. There is good news for us today. And so the people we see in this, in this passage, we have Jesus and we have this man, Jairus, and the woman. 
And so there's this big crowd of people. They're pressing in on him. Everyone knows who Jesus is. And this man comes through. He's an important man. He's someone well-known in this society. Uh, and his name is Jairus. He's the leader of the synagogue. He has high standing. Yet when he comes to Jesus, he falls at his feet. He humbles himself before Jesus. To, and to this man who he's heard about, who's been healing the sick, who's been performing these miracles, casting out demons, doing all of these things, and he falls before him because he's heard about what Jesus has done and because his, he has a 12-year-old daughter who is dying. And so Jesus, he's, he's, he, he listens to the man and he goes on his way, but then we also then we meet this woman and just kind of to emphasize the point, we don't even know the woman's name. So we know Jairus, everyone knows Jairus' name, yet this woman, we're not told her name. She's kind of invisible. Uh, she, we, people don't know who she is. She's, uh, she's not important in the society. And she's sick and she's in pain and she's been bleeding for 12 years, which means she's unable to have children. She's considered unclean. Uh, she wasn't allowed to come in contact with people. She shouldn't have been out in public in this setting. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't touch anyone. She couldn't hug anyone. Just imagine uh, COVID, but instead of those strict rules for six months or 12 months or whatever it might have been, it was for 12 years where she can't come in contact with anyone. Right? She was an outcast in what seemed like a hopeless situation. She was invisible to those around her, while Jairus, he was very visible. He was known to everyone. But both of them needed Jesus. And so the woman, she had tried, we, we read in the passage, she tried everything that the world had to offer. She'd seen physicians who spent all her money, all of her living had gone onto it, but she'd remain unhealed, she'd remain unempty, she'd remained uh, unclean. But she hadn't totally given up hope because she'd heard of this, this man who was going around doing incredible things, and so she put, she put her hope onto him. She'd heard about Jesus and what he was doing. And so here she comes into the midst of the hustle and bustle of the crowd, pressing in on Jesus, wanting to see him, wanting to get a glimpse of him. And she risks everything to touch Jesus. And as, as the crowds follow Jesus, he, as he heads towards Jairus' house, she sees her moment as there's a gap in the crowd and she grabs hold of his robe. Right, The same robe that we read about in Isaiah 6 the other the other week, the, the train of his robe, which fills the temple. She grabs hold of it, knowing a touch of Jesus can heal her. And she's healed. She lays hold of his garment, and power goes out from Jesus, and she is instantly healed. And then there's this comical interaction between the him, Jesus and his disciples who are saying, and Jesus says, wait there, the power has gone out from me. Who has just touched me? And they're saying, well, everyone's touching you. Can you not see that this guy's pressing in you? This, this person's pressing in. This person's brushing up against you. And this person's trying to get a photo with you. And this person wants your autograph. And all of these things are going on. Of course, it's, of course there are people touching you. And when I've read I've not really thought about it before, but when I was reading it again this, this week, I thought of Jairus, because I don't really, you kind of forget about Jairus, this guy who's, whose daughter is dying, and Jesus is standing there in the midst of a crowd pressing in on him, saying, who's just touched me? <laughs> and then waiting to find, and no one answers, he waits. And Jairus is standing there thinking, my daughter's dying, and we're just standing here in the middle of a, a busy crowd, and you're just waiting. Now, I reckon all of us can put ourselves in a position of, if a loved one if a loved one was dying, what would you, how would you be feeling in that situation? Like it made me think of when, I think he was two, Caleb was two or three, and had this horrific experience of sitting in our, in our kitchen at dinner time with Evelyn and Caleb and, and Rachel, and then all of a sudden, leave, uh, Caleb just goes stiff in his high chair and starts like, having a, a seizure of some kind. And I'm not a medical person, so I was just absolutely... Terrified, and we get him out of the high chair just about because he's gone stiff as a board. So it's like, yeah. Anyway, and and we phone the we phone the ambulance, and I'm th and I'm standing there thinking, my, I'm watching my son die, and I'm completely helpless. And if a paramedic had walked into the room, 
And I'm like, yeah, yeah, here's my, here's my, here's my son. What do we do? What do we do? Is he going to be okay? And the paramedic takes a phone call and says, one minute, one minute. This might be important. Oh, that was it. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yeah, book me three tickets for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, NS, you know, if it's something that's not as urgent as my immediate, as my immediate situation, like it feels like this, this woman and her situation has been going on for 12 years. What's another 12 minutes? Let's get to the house and sort things out. Yet yeah, Jesus, he stops and he gives time to this woman who is invisible to everyone else. Right? He demonstrates himself as the master, as the one who is above all things over sickness and death. Right, remember, again, the passage in Isaiah 6 that we started with, this vision of Jesus, high and lifted up, seated on a throne, the train of his robe filling the temple. Jesus is seated on a throne. He's not running here and running there, panicking about things, spinning a load of plates, just hoping he's not going to drop one. But he is in control. Even when we don't understand it, even when we are not sure what's going on and we can be frustrated, we can trust God that he knows what is going on. Earlier in this chapter, um, in Jesus calms the storm, in verse 20, 22. So we see he's not, just, he's not just over sickness and death, but he can control the elements. And even here, the, his followers ask him, ask him in verse 25, they say, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he wakes and he says to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled, saying to one another, saying to one another who then is this that commands even winds and water and they obey him? Right, so God, Jesus is over all of these things. He can raise the sick. He can control the wind and the waves. And the question that the disciples are asking as he calms the storm is the same question that we're asking. As one of the questions we're asking as we go through this series, this Jesus series, is who is this man? Who is this man who is seated on a throne, who can heal the sick, who controls the sea and the wind and the waves? And what impact will he have on my life and on your life? Will we recognize the, the reality that most of our world turns its back on, our culture turns our back on Jesus? But where are we going to, where are we going to look for our comfort and our security? Are we going to look to ourselves just like, or are we going to look to Jesus as we looked at in our series in Haggai? Where are we building? Are we building on, on a solid foundation or are we just building our own things, the things that will crumble and fall away and are ultimately insignificant? Right, what we see here in this Jesus' interaction with Jairus and with the woman is the, the true king who is seated on a throne, the king of kings and the lord of lords. And we see these two individuals who are taking hold of the kingdom of God, who are, who are deliberately going to, going to Jesus and taking hold of him. So while Jairus waits, in whatever he's feeling, exasperated, just grief-stricken or angry, Jesus asks, who has touched me? And the woman responds, and Jesus' reply is beautiful. Well, he doesn't say to me, who has touched me? And then the woman responds, says, she, lets, she says, this is why I touched you, this is why I've come. He doesn't say to a woman, why did you do this? Or he doesn't say, oi, you. But he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Right, she is called daughter. And she, as she sees Jesus... In his holiness, she falls at his feet. The unapproachable God has become approachable. Right? She's, the, the term daughter suggests doesn't it, that she's been included into a family. She's not just, he's not just said, you have been healed, but he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Right? She's been adopted into a family. She's been drawn from the very margins of society. She, as an outcast, she has been drawn in to the family of God, where she is known and she gets to know others. And it's the same for us as, as people who are as a followers of Jesus. We haven't just been adopted into an, an, a single child family just to do our own thing, us and Jesus, but we get to be adopted into a family, into a local church. Obviously, we're part of a bigger thing, 
but we get to be, we're adopted into a family, a local church family where we're loved and accepted. And time and time again, we get pointed to Jesus. And when we're struggling, we get pointed to Jesus. Look at Jesus in his beauty and his glory. Right? And let, let, let us fix our eyes on him to get things in perspective. And so despite her reluctance to be noticed, she, wanted to, uh, she may have wanted to stay on the margins and just be healed and then go back to doing, doing whatever she wants to do. She acted in faith. And Jesus, in saying, who has touched me? He's not exposing her weakness, but exposing her faith. Right? He wanted her faith to be visible that, uh, so that everyone who carries shame like this woman carries which is every one of us, might have hope. And Jesus, he's the one who carries all of our sin and our shame. He takes it all to the cross. He takes it on himself. He takes the punishment that we deserve and he calls us clean and righteous and loved and accepted. He calls us sons and daughters. So Jesus, the great physician, Right, the one who has power to heal every sin, every weakness, every failure, every illness, every evil committed against us. He promises healing to those who believe. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right, so we can have a, a real faith in a living God. Right, and one day we will see him in all of his glory and majesty, but in the in-between time we get to hold on to what we, uh, while we don't see the full reality. Right, we get to hold on to the one who is seated on a throne, the one who later on in Revelation 21 verse 5, it says, Behold, I am making all things new. But until that, until that point, we get to see Jesus. We get a vision of Jesus, the one who came down and was born of a virgin, the one who comes into, into uh, society and interacts with people, not the not the. Uh, the elite of society, but comes to those on the margins, comes to the sick and the vulnerable and the forgotten and invisible, and he draws them into a family. And so for us this morning, where are we at? Right, as there's this crowd, there's this hustle, hustle and bustle, people pressing in, wanting to get close to Jesus. He's like an, a celebrity with his celebrity status. All of these people touching him, and yet they don't encounter Jesus in the same way as the woman. They don't encounter Jesus in the same way as, as Jairus. And so if you're here this morning, I wonder, where are you at? Are you, are you happy? Are you content with just being in the, in the hustle, right, in the fray? Happy to be in the crowd, kind of getting to see Jesus through the songs that we sing or through where, when you read your Bible or, when we, uh, or whatever it might be. Right, because that, that's, that's a place where there are plenty of people. There's a large crowd following him, and that's where they're at. But really, they're missing out. It's a sad place to be. It's an empty place to be. Because although they're in the presence of Jesus, they completely miss Jesus. They don't, get, they don't encounter Jesus in the same way. What I want for us, what I want for me, I want to be someone who takes hold of Jesus who says, maybe I don't understand everything, but like in, in Mark 9, the, the, the man Jesus is talking to, I'll get it, I'll read it, I'll read the proper verse rather than paraphrasing it. Right, this, the, a child is sick and the father says to, says to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Right, so we can come this morning, you don't need to have it all together, we don't need to, we don't need to know everything. We can say, Jesus, I believe in you, but help my unbelief. Right, we want to see King Jesus, the one who is high and lifted up, yet who died on a cross for me, for us. 
right? The one who calms the winds and the waves, the creator of the universe, yet the one who loves us. Band, if you want to come up. Can we stand as we... We're going to finish by praying and then we're going to sing. Right, just as we've, the th- kind of what came through the worship, like Pete summed up for us, was uh, this theme of invitation. And whether you're, like, whether you're like, find, you find yourself, you're kind of like right by the door, you're kind of skirting around, you couldn't be any more fringe, or whether you're, you're part of this family, but are still kind of just struggling with different things in your life, and and just need to need more of Jesus. Like we're all, it's a journey and we find ourselves at different parts on that journey. There's an invitation for us to step more into what God has for us this morning, more into the relationship that Jesus longs for you and I. And so I'm just going to pray for us and then, we're going to, then we'll sing. God, I thank you. For your son, Jesus, I thank you that you came down for us. Not to, not to condemn us, but to rescue us. I thank you that you who are unimpro- unapproachable in your holiness became approachable in Jesus. And I pray, help us to see more of you. Help us to be drawn into your family draw more and more into your purposes for, for us and us as, a, us as a church and for what we're doing in this town and what, what we're doing in the nations. God, I thank you for Rod right now. I pray for him as he's serving in, uh, in Bromley in the church there. God, I pray that you would draw us in. I pray for those who are here this morning who are on the fringe, who who feel like, uh, like this, this woman, on the out, an outcast in society, God, that they would, we would know your love this morning. Amen.